Okay, so we begin with the question that arrived, and the question was that uh, due to Geshe's kindness, I have come to understand, see clearly certain things I could not see before, and I could see some faults in my behavior. I have a lot of uh, regret for those things, and uh, I am determined from now on definitely to practice the three main causes that establish a good human rebirth. But is there anything else in addition to that that I should be doing? So, of course, we say that in order to establish a good, a precious human rebirth in the next life, it is very important to establish the three reasons. And those three reasons are, first of all, to have pure ethics. And in the case of a, a lay person, this means holding the, maintaining the morality of abandoning the 10 non-virtuous actions. Then if the second reason is to do uh, pure prayers and the prayers here, as we say, the minimum should be prayers for something good, a good rebirth in the next life. So in particular, one should be praying to, to have a good rebirth as a human or a God in the next life. And the third one was to practice the six perfections that have become the substantial causes that are aiding they, are, they aid, they support that result. So definitely you should practice generosity, you should practice ethics, concentration, enthusiastic effort, and so forth. So Geshe was saying, I think that once you establish those three causes, the only thing you could do on top of that is to meditate according to the Lam Rim. If you take on these meditations of the Lam Rim seriously, then your life becomes meaningful. That means you will be extracting the essence of this life. And Geshe says, I cannot see anything additional that you could do. That should be more than enough. That should be sufficient to establish a good human rebirth. Okay, so Geshe and I would like to go back and revisit a question that we had in the last session. There was a question about, you know, we talked about the three main causes for establishing a good rebirth. And the first one of them was a pure ethics. The second one was stainless prayers. And the third one was the supportive uh, aspects of the six perfections. Okay, so there was a question last week about this uh, pure ethics, like what is the measure? What is the limit? How do you define pure ethics? And last week, Geshe Lai interpreted the ethics of lay, lay practitioners in accordance with the way that we define the ethics for the ordained. So Geshe Lai said that from among the 10 non-virtuous actions, if you can avoid four root ones, the first one being killing a human, the second one is um, t taking something of value, like stealing something of value, the third one is um, committing sexual misconduct, and the fourth one is saying a lie. But Geshe says I looked at other Lamrim texts, more extensive commentaries and so forth. And I would like to uh, change my response to this question. So for lay people, it is important that all 10 non-virtuous actions are avoided. So we should make the effort to avoid all of them. So this is what it means to have pure ethics for a lay person. And if we have some weakness, and let's say one or two or something, you know, we transgress one of them, or even more than one of them, then it is important to confess straight away. If we are sullied by the non-virtue, of uh, committing one of the 10 non-virtuous actions. It is important not to ignore it, not to think that this is insignificant. We should consider this to be important and therefore confess and purify. And in this way, we will be able to maintain or restore the purity of the ethics. When it comes to ordained people, uh, as we say, pure morality is to hold the four root vows. And if you break any of the secondary vows, then again, recognize and confess it straight away. 
Okay, so let's uh, connect, let's link to where we left off uh, last uh, week. So we were looking at the main outlines that you find on page eight. We have an exhortation to take full advantage of a life of leisure and opportunity. And then the second outline is how to take full advantage of a life of leisure and opportunity. So um, we are looking at the second outline so if you go on page 11, it says the outline, how to take full advantage of a life of leisure and opportunity. It has three subdivisions, training the mind in the stages of the path shared with persons of small capacity, training the mind in the stages of the path shared with persons of medium capacity, and training the mind in the stages of the path of persons of great capacity. We begin with the first one, which is training the mind uh, in the stages of the path that are shared with a person of small capacity. It has two, it's split into two, how to practice during the formal meditation ses session and how to practice du during the intervals between sessions. Uh, the formal meditation session consists of preparation, the actual practice, and conclusion. So regarding the preparation, as we did before, in the way that how we meditate, we prepare to meditate on the way to rely on the teacher, first we make requests. So we make the request up to the point where it says, I make a request to you, Buddha Vajradhara, the Supreme Guru Yidam, synthesis of all objects of refuge. And then we reflect. All countless mother sentient beings and myself, having taken rebirth in samsara, have undergone various and intense sufferings for a long time. This is due to the fact of not having reflected on the uncertainty of death, not having taken refuge from the depth of one's heart in the three jewels because of fearing the sufferings of the three bad migrations, not having undertaken correctly the practice of adopting and discarding white and black karma respectively, after having generated faith of belief in the law of causality. Therefore, I beseech you, Supreme Guru Yidam, bless us so that we generate mindfulness about the uncertainty of death and fear of the suffering of the three bad migrations, thus taking refuge from the depth of one's heart in the three jewels and also being able to correctly discard destructive actions and adopt constructive ones. So we recognize what is going on. We request the blessings to generate these types of realizations. And as a, request, as a result of our request, due to this fervent request from the body of the Guru Yidam, at the crown of your head descends nectar together with five colors light, which enters into you as well as in all mother sentient beings' bodies and minds. It purifies all negativities and obscurations collected from beginningless time. In particular, it purifies spirits, illness, obscurations, and negativities that hinder the generation of the special realization of the stages of the path shared with persons of small capacity. Our bodies become limpid, clear, and luminous. All good qualities, such as merit, lifespan, and so forth, improve and expand. In particular, imagine that the special realizations of the stages of the path shared with persons of small capacity is generated in all of our minds. So in particular, we imagine that this, re this recollection of death and impermanence, going for, being able to go for refuge, remembering the suffering of the lower migrations, and having faith in the law of cause and effect is generated um, in our mind stream. All right, so you can see that those were the preliminaries, and then the next one is the actual practice. So the actual practice is again divided into four. Reflecting on the uncertainty, uncertainty of the time of death, reflecting on the unfortunate rebirth sufferings, training in going for refuge, and generating the faith of belief in the law of causality. So if you are training in the path that is shared with the individual of the small scope, you have to follow gradually those four outlines. So these four outlines summarize the training that is shared with the individual of the small scope. So you see here that it says reflecting on the uncertainty 
of the time of death. So really here we're dealing with the subject of death and impermanence. And in terms of impermanence, we have gross impermanence and we have subtle impermanence. Here in the easy path, we only have one short outline. It's just mentioning the uncertainty of death. However, if we look at other more extensive lamrims, we will see that we have three outlines. First of all, we have the... Um, drawbacks or, or the shortcomings of not remembering death and then we have the actual way to remember death. In terms of the faults of not remembering death, there are six of these faults enumerated. In terms of the benefits, there are six benefits enumerated. And in terms of the actual way to uh, remember death, we have, a two, we have two things that we do. The first one is we go through the nine aspects of remembering death. And the other one is performing meditation in the aspect of death. So we will follow this more extensive presentation. Okay, so first of all, let's enumerate the six faults that come from not remembering death. If you don't have a recollection of death, you will not practice Dharma. That's the first one. The second one, um, um, you will not want to practice Dharma. The second one is that even if you practice Dharma, this practice will not be pure. The third one is that even if you practice Dharma, um, the practice will not be diligent. The next one is that your bad behavior uh, will um, remain. Meaning if you don't have recollection of death and impermanence, you are just uh, keep thinking about this life and you follow the attachment and the hatred in this life. And that means that you will exhibit or you will engage in really negative behavior. And the last one is that at the end, you will die with regret. Okay, so let's uh, look at this list. So we say that if you don't have recollection of death, the first fault is that you will not remember Dharma at all. So if you don't have recollection of death, it means that you will spend your whole life and all your energy preoccupied uh, with worldly things. Like uh, you want to get food, you want to get clothes, you want to get this or that. Um, thing or necessity or luxury and you spend all your time in that like you're not concerned about uh, death and therefore you're not even thinking about practicing dharma actually all these worldly activities they have this common trend of totally consuming our time and our energy so all your t all your the, your entire life will be spent just following these pursuits worldly pursuits the second is that even if you do remember Dharma, you will never come to the point of practicing it. As Jerem Boche says, we all think I will die, but at the same time we think I will not die today. And again, the next day you think I will not die today. And in this way, people arrive on their last day, the day that they actually die, and they are still thinking I will not die today. So we have this tendency of actually procrastinating. So you say, yes, I will practice, I remember Dharma, I will practice Dharma, but not straight away next year or the year after that or the year after that. And due to our procrastination, we end up not practicing Dharma at all. So death comes before we actually practice Dharma. The next one is that even if you practice it, you will not practice it properly. Not practice it properly indicates that whatever you do will be mixed with the eight worldly concerns. Actually, the eight worldly concerns are very deeply ingrained in our behavior because we have so much attraction for this life really everything we do is mixed with the eight worldly concerns. And as soon as we have that contamination, the Dharma is not proper Dharma practice. We continue in the list. So the fourth one in the list is that if you do not remember death, you will not practice seriously. So seriously here has this indication you don't practice emphatically 
or you don't practice with continuity. And you see that as soon as we start doing some practice, very quickly we become tired. And what we want to do is just stop it or put an end to it or, you know, abandon the practice. There is this lack of effort, of enthusiastic effort. There is lack of intensity. However, if you have recollection of death, you will find that you have this enthusiastic effort. It actually motivates you to do the practice with intensity, to do the practice continuously. So in this way, you will be doing the practice seriously. The next point is that if you don't have recollection of um, uh, death, you will continue acting in a vulgar way. You will continue acting in a bad way. The reason for that is because you have great attachment um, for this life. And that means that you are going to be paying great attention to those who benefit you and to those who harm you. And according to the, the, these activities, you will generate attachment or very strong anger towards these people. And by following your attachment and your anger, you will see that you will find yourself entangled, entangled in disputes, in fights, um, in confrontations, and so on and so so forth. So actually it all comes from being so attached to this life and that brings definitely, it brings bad behavior with this. And now we come to the last shortcoming in the list is that if you don't remember death and impermanence, you will end up dying with a lot of um, regret. We call ourselves Dharma practitioners, but the reality is that without recollection of death and impermanence, we are just a mere reflection of a practitioner. It means there's no substance to our practice. It means that we are not doing enough. And one day, imagine that you become sick and that sickness quickly deteriorates and that leads to your death. And when you realize that death is approaching and your time is finished, suddenly you will say, I haven't done enough. I haven't accumulated enough of virtue, enough merit. So I'm going to die and I'm moving ahead unprepared without enough provisions. And that will bring a great regret. So we've spoke about uh, the five faults that come from not remembering death and now we're going to look at the, sorry, the six. And now we're going to look at the six benefits of actually remembering death. The first one is that your life will become most meaningful, most beneficial. And the reason for that is because if you do remember death, actually you will practice Dharma, you will practice it well. And as a result of that, you will uh, make this life, this human rebirth, uh, very beneficial. There's quite a lot to be achieved on the basis of practicing Dharma. The Buddha himself has said in the Great Sutra of Buddha's Nirvana that amongst animal tracts, that of the elephant is the best. And amongst all other attitudes, that of death and impermanence is the best. So it's the best recollection to have because it makes our life very meaningful. The second um, benefit is that it is very powerful. It is very powerful because if you have recollection of death and impermanence, this has the power to completely abandon, to turn your back into all of those afflictions, all the um, desire, all the hatred, all those things that we get entangled in. You know, if you realize that death is looming, you just turn your back to all those things. So it's a very powerful recollection to have. The third benefit, third, fourth, and fifth, you can say is that it is very beneficial at the beginning, very beneficial in the middle, and very beneficial at the end. So recollection of death and impermanence is very important, very beneficial at the beginning because it actually makes you engage, commence the Dharma practice. It's very beneficial in the middle because it stimulates you. It gives you the energy, the enthusiastic effort to continue, persevere with the practice. And it is very beneficial at the end because it allows you to complete the practice that you are doing. And then uh, the last, the sixth benefit is that you will die happily and joyfully. 
So with the six of those benefits, we say that you have recollection of death and impermanence, you will die happily. The reason why you will die happily is because you will reach the time of death and you will look back into your life and you say, I practice well. I have done very well in this life. So then it says you will enter death in, in a happy state of mind. And this is described as... Uh, a child going to meet the father. So there is this, you know, looking forward to that event. Um, and uh, Langtro Lama Rinpoche has said, I do not mind impermanence at all. At uh, the beginning of the day, I will be an old monk. And then when death happens at the end of the day, I will come around and obtain the body of a god, of a deity. So I'm not afraid of it at all. So when we look at practitioners, we can grade them as being supreme, middling, or the least practitioners according to how they approach death. The supreme practitioners approach death with um, joy and happiness, as we say. The medium level of practitioners approaches death without having a sense that, oh, this is something to be avoided. I feel uncomfortable around it. And the least type of practitioners um, arrive at death with a great sense of regret. Okay, so now we come to the actual part, which is the actual meditation on death. And we say here there are actually three root principles that we need to meditate upon. The first one is that death is definite, certain. The second one is that the time of death is uncertain. And the third one is that at the time of death, only Dharma can be of benefit. So for the first one where we say that death is definite, we actually give three reasons that help us meditate on this point. So death is uh, definitely certain because the first reason, the Lord of death is definitely coming and no condition can um, reverse this. So in other words, there is no way that you can avoid death. It's coming, no one can avoid it. The second one is that your life cannot be extended and it is constantly diminished. So second by second, something is taken away from the, your entire lifespan, right? So it's diminishing. It's a count, countdown. The third one is that even while you are alive, there is little time for practicing Dharma. So you realize I won't come around to practice Dharma after all. So as we say here, we need to perform this meditation. So you visualize that you have your root guru at the crown of your head and you begin uh, requesting, um, you know, contemplating and requesting blessings to meditate on this subject. And you say, I understand that the Lord, but that death will definitely come. And the first reason for that is that the Lord of death is approaching and there is nothing that can change this. Nothing can reverse this. So whatever type of life, whatever type of body I establish, it's not a type of body that can transcend death. I have obtained right now this very excellent body, the body that is um, endowed with all the freedoms and endowments, the 18 of those unique qualities. And yet even this body is a body that uh, is subject to death. And if I look at all, all the Buddhas and all the Bodhisattvas, all those great beings, uh, they also have passed away. And even our own, our own teacher, Buddha Shakyamuni, manifested the aspect of passing Nirvana. And not only that, but also the great disciples, the Arhats, such as uh, the great Shariputra and so forth. Actually, five, a group of five, 500 Arhats when they saw the Buddha passing away, they could not bear the pain of losing the teacher. And since they had control over life, they also passed into Paranirvana. And now only their names remain. So I can see that nothing can actually avert, nothing can stop the coming of death. 
So we need to consider reflecting on this issue that uh, there is nothing whatsoever that can reverse the coming of death. So just consider in, there is not one person, there is not one being that has been born and did not have to die. Everyone had to die. Even the Buddhas show the aspect of having to die. Even the Arhats show the aspect of passing into Paranirvana. And they have bodies that are much more refined than our bodies. Here I am, I have an ordinary body with skin and flesh and bones. So how could I ever conceive that this gross body, right? It's a very gross, it's a very vulnerable body. How could I think that me with this type of body could somehow survive? How could I think that somehow I would escape death? It is impossible. No matter what type of body you have, you will have to die at the end. No matter which place you actually live in, you will have to um, experience death. You cannot avoid the death. And there is no difference in terms of how death would affect people in the past or how it will affect people in the future. Death just affects everyone in the sense that no one can actually escape it. Um, and we come to the point where we're saying no one can escape death, right? There is no condition that can allow you to escape it. If you could outrun death, if you could fly up in the sky and avoid death, then there are those um, siddhas, you know, those uh, who have magical powers and can fly away or can move very fast. But still, they cannot outrun death. They cannot escape death. Also, do not think that wealth and power uh, is going to help you escape death. If you look, for example, even someone who is born as a universal monarch, a universal monarch has those unbelievable control, control of their resources, incredible power, um, and they have everything around them, you know, the, be the best support around them. However, still, they cannot avoid death. They have a long life, but when that life comes to the end, they have to die. And finally, there is no mantras and there is no medicine that can help you to definitely escape death. No matter how good the physician is, no matter how good the latest technology, the best medicine they offer you, at the end, you will have to die. And in terms of um, mantras, uh, even Vajrapani has said, you know, there is no such a thing, no mantra to give you to avoid death. Okay, so as we say here, we go through all these points and finally we come to this conclusion that says there is nothing that can help me avoid death. There is no condition. There is no way that can avoid death. However, if I have poor, pure virtue, if I, ha if I have immaculate root of virtue, when death comes, and death is unavoid unavoidable, when this death finally comes, comes, I will have nothing to fear. But if we examine our situation now, it's very hard for any of us to say that I have immaculate virtue. Actually, if we look at the amount of virtue that we have, it is most uh, certain, most obvious that we can only take a bad rebirth in one of the lower migrations. And once we breathe out our last breath, then consciousness will separate from that body. The body will become a corpse, a lifeless corpse, and consciousness will continue in a type of rebirth that is not a favorable one. So considering all this, you can, we can naturally reach the conclusion and say, at the end, the only thing can be of benefit is Dharma. And therefore, my conclusion is that I will practice Dharma. I will practice Dharma well. So now we make the request to the Guru. And he said, please, Guru Buddha, bless me to be able to practice the Dharma properly. So as you can see, we're going through the first of uh, the roots or the main things that we consider with death, that uh, death is certain. And the first reason is that death is definitely coming and nothing can avert it. 
Okay, so we then continue with the second reason that establishes uh, that death is certain. And the second reason is considering that our lifetime cannot be extended and it is constantly diminished. So constantly diminished here, it means that every second that goes by, we have less of a life remaining. And the thing is that we do not know exactly how much life uh, is left. So I guess I'm saying, I'm looking at my own personal example. I'm now 49 years old. So let's say you could say, you know, I'm 50 years old. I have no idea how much of my life is remaining, right? And, but we know, you know, from the average lifespan of people uh, these days that you could say, you know, half of my life is gone. And when someone gets into their 70s, then you would say that most of the life is gone and there is not so much life remaining. The thing is that with every breath we take, we come closer to the time of death because with every breath we take, our, our lifespan becomes a, a little bit shorter. It is said that in the duration of one day, 24 hours, we take a total of 21,600 breaths. So you see, if you take one breath now, it means that you are only have a remainder of 21,599 breaths. And this is how uh, the time is reduced more and more and more. And this is how you go through second by second or breath by breath. You go through one day. By the, when the days go by, you go through one week. You will go through a month. You will go through a year. And then you will go through a whole de decade. This is how our life is constantly reduced. And the thing is that nothing is added to it. When initially with the karma that initially establishes this life, establishes the duration of the life. So there's nothing to add to it, only to subtract. We come now to the third reason. So for the first point, which is that death is definite, we have explained the first two reasons. The first reason is that the Lord of death is definitely coming and there is no way to avoid it. And the second reason is that the lifetime, the life, um, time cannot be extended, but it is constantly diminished. We come to the third reason. The third reason says that even when you are alive, there is very little time for practicing the Dharma. And we see that because, for example, the first, uh, okay, let's say an example of a hundred uh, years, an average uh, lifespan, a generous uh, average lifespan, you will see that even if you have a hundred years, the, f the first part of your life when you are young, you do not think about practicing Dharma. So let's say the first 15 years of your life, actually you don't spend any, you don't have any serious consideration about practicing Dharma. Then once you reach about the age 15, 17, you know, you have other concerns. So you need, you're looking for, you know, your food, your clothes, your um, a place to live, um, you're looking for a job, you start looking for a partner, you begin a family, you do all sorts of, uh, you engage in all sorts of activities. And this can easily take another 15 years of your life. Then as you continue with your life, you will see that a great deal of your life is taken trying to overcome um, things such as illness or harm, harm that you can receive from, you know, external conditions, internal conditions, or different blows that you get in life. So intense suffering, different traumas that you encounter, all those things, they actually take time to deal with or time to recover. And as you will see, most of your life is actually consumed with those things. And if you add sleep, into that, you will see that at the end, there is very, very little time left to practice Dharma. 
It is uh, the majority of us. Uh, actually, we have this thought that says, I will practice Dharma, I will study it, I will practice it, I will do it well. So we do have that intention. But at the same time, we have not given up about concerns of this life. So we work very hard. We use our energy, our time, um, our life basically to establish certain things. We want to have a certain lifestyle. We want to have wealth. We want to have status. We want to have money. We want to have a very good reputation to become famous and so on and so forth. And as for as long as we are holding on into those things, as long as we are attached to, let's say, the glory and the fame of this life, for that long, we will not be able to practice, um, um, to practice properly. The thing is that whatever results, whatever material results and wealth and uh, opulence and so forth, you know, we achieve in this life, we have to understand that it is actually the result of previous karma. So there has to be a combination of our own efforts, of course, in this life, but a lot, it, it comes from karma that we have created in the past. So it has to be a combination of two. We seem to be forgetting this and we keep uh, striving and striving and working harder and harder for more and more. And as we do this, as we push for more and more, actually we experience quite a lot of suffering. Even if we obtain those uh, luxury items, let's say, or, you know, all those material goals that we have in our life, at the end, they only give us pain and suffering when we come at the time of death none of those things are going to be of any benefit those things are not going to support us at the time of death actually they will give us even more agony they will give us even more suffering because it will be very hard to even separate from those things the thing is that even if we achieved everything according to our wishes it will be like something that you see in a dream and then you wake up and when you wake up the moment you wake up the dream is over so this is how it ends with all these material achievements so we have to definitely reach this conclusion that says i will stop i will not be doing this anymore i'm not going to be pursuing all these material goals I will practice Dharma, I will practice properly. And then we request the Guru at the crown of the head to please help us to achieve this and visualize the descent of nectars that purify us and give us the energy to meditate properly. So we're going through this med the actual meditation on death that, as we say, involves uh, nine aspects. We go through the three roots and the nine reasoning. We have done the first root. The first root is to consider that death is definite, and we have gone through the three reasonings for that. We now continue with the second root, which is that the actual time of death is uncertain. Again, we're going to give three reasons. So the actual time of death is uncertain certain because number one the lifespan in this continent Champudvipa is not certain reason number two the causes of death are very many whilst the causes for life are few and reason number three we have very fragile bodies so for the first one that we say the first reason that the lifespan in this continent is uncertain Often people think that, you know what, I will die when I'm old. I will die when I'm approaching 100 years. But right now, I'm quite young. Right now, I don't have any disease. I don't have any illness. I don't have any enemies. Actually, the conditions around me, you know, good food, good accommodation, all this. Everything is favorable. I'm still young. I, I will not die. Actually, this is a false way of thinking. There is no guarantee whatsoever that you will not die young. There is no guarantee that you will only die when you become old. We see many cases of um, infants 
you know, according, people according to their karma, they will die at a certain age, and it could be a very early age. So we see uh, infants that they die within the womb of the mother, or we see others that they die immediately after birth. We see others die when they are so young, they are not even standing up on their feet, so they are still toddlers, they are still crawling. Or we see others who die just as they're able to take their first steps. Or some that, you know, they're able to walk, but they're still very young children. We see so many cases of this around us. So this idea, I will not die because I am young, is unfounded, right? There is no certainty of the lifespan. So remember here that we're going through the first reason of the second root point. The second root point is that the actual time of death is not certain. So we will die, but we don't know the exact time of our death. And one of the reasons that we give for that is that people will live according to the individual karma that they have. Some will live longer, some will live shorter. We see people who die at a very young age to think that I don't have enemies, I don't have disease, I am healthy right now, I am young right now. All those things are false reasoning. We see a lot of people who die even though they don't have enemies. We see a lot of people who die even though they don't have a disease. We see a lot of young people dying. So just consider that all of those things um, actually happen because the lifespan that we have here in this continent is uncertain. Therefore, the time of death is uncertain. We come to the second reason, and the second reason is that there are so many conditions that contribute to our death and very few that contribute to our life. So we see that there are many external and internal conditions that can bring about our death. So some people die because they have external enemies or they come in contact with weapons or with poisons and things like that. Other people are killed by thieves and robbers who come in to steal their wealth. And, you know, as they're stealing their wealth, they also kill them. Other people die because someone puts a spell on them by using black magic and mantras in this way. Other people come die because they uh, meet with uh, different types of illnesses and sicknesses and they become ill. Um, others, they die because of the external enemies. So, for example, you know, they can be floods or they can be earthquakes and things like that the elements of earth and water and wind, they can uh, rob us of our life. So there are myriads of conditions that contribute to our death and very few that contribute to, our, to sustaining our life. So we have already said that there are many conditions that contribute to our death. And then we say there are very few conditions that support our life. In this list of conditions, you could say, for example, the food, the clothes, the house, the money, the wealth that we have, the environment around us, all those things are supporting our lives. However, there is no guarantee that those things will definitely support and prolong the life because they can turn around and become even those things can become conditions that bring about our death. So for example, we mentioned food, but if you eat the wrong food at the wrong time or the food has gone off, it can actually contribute to your death. We talk about having, for example, wealth or having a good house. Yes, but if your wealth and your house, for example, attracts thieves and they break into the house, they might kill you in the course of the robbery and so forth. So even conditions that, the few conditions that we say that support the life can turn around and bring about a death. And therefore we say, due to all these conditions contributing to death, there's no certainty of the exact time of death.
We're going through the second route, which is the actual time of death is not certain. As we say, there are three reasons that we give for that. We have already explained the first two. The first one is that the lifespan of beings in Jambut Vipa is not certain. The second one is that the conditions for death are very many, whilst the conditions for life are very few. And now we come to the third reason. So the time of death is uncertain because we have bodies that are very fragile. So something very minor, such as, for example, being pierced by a thorn can actually become, cause major complications and become the cause of your death. So for that reason as well, we say that the actual time of death is not certain. So we come now to the third root point. We have already established that death is certain, but the actual time of death is uncertain. The third root is that at the time of death, only Dharma can be of benefit. The three reasons that we give for that is that wealth cannot be of benefit, relatives and friends cannot be of benefit, and even your own body cannot be of benefit. So first of all, we say, you know, if you, you might have accumulated a lot of wealth, you have a lot of money, but none of those things is going to be beneficial at the time of death. Actually, you can take none of this with you and they will not affect your next life. The same thing applies to the friends and relatives. You could be someone very popular with many friends, many relatives, but at the time of death, you will die alone and you will move along on yourself, you know, in the next life. And finally, it's not only that wealth and relatives can be of no benefit, but even your own body, this body that you have established, is not going to be of benefit because it's something that we leave behind at the time of death. And therefore, the one and only thing that can be of benefit is Dharma at the time of death. So if you go to page 12 now, following the easy path, uh, it says, as for the first one, so the first we reflect is reflecting on the uncertainty of death. While meditating on Guru Yidam on top of your head, contemplate as follows. So remember how we do this uh, single-pointed request, like driving a peg into the ground. We have come to this point, and uh, we have the Guru Yidam on the top of your head, and we contemplate the following. This life of leisure and opportunity, which is so rare and meaningful, perishes quickly. So what we're doing here, as you can see, we are performing a bullet point quick meditation on the previous subject. So the previous subject was the, the precious human rebirth, the life of, with the leisure, the opportunity. It is very rare to find and it's very meaningful. So that's a very quick revision meditation. So what happens to this life? It perishes quickly. So we're talking about death. Death will definitely come, right? So it perishes quickly and the Lord of death will definitely arrive. So this is the first principle, the first root that death is certain. And then we're going to give the three reasons here. It says not only that, there are no external or internal conditions that can stop it. So that's the first reason. Then it says our lifetime constantly diminishes and there is no way to extend it. That's the second reason. Even while we are alive, there is little time for religious practice. That's the third reason. So we have here the first root with its three reasons. It continues. We will die, but the time of our death is, uh, is uncertain. So this is the second route. The actual time of death is uncertain. So now come the three reasons for that. Reason number one, the lifespan in this southern continent of ours is uncertain. Reason number two, the causes of death are very many and the causes of life are few. Reason number three, the time of death is uncertain because our body is fragile like a water bubble. So the second route with its three reasons. Now we go for the third route. At the time of death, nothing helps except religious practice. So now we give the reasons. No matter how many relatives and friends who surround us we may have, we can't take any of them. The second reason, no matter how many excellent possessions we have, we cannot take even the smallest. 
The third reason, since we will have to part even from this flesh and bones and so forth. So even this flesh and bones that has been together with us from the very beginning, from the time of conception, as we developed in the womb all the way up to now, even this, bon this um, body of flesh and bones, we cannot even take this with us. So we have the third root with, the th with its own three sets of reasons. So what's the point of having attachment for the desirable things in this life? All those worldly material goals that we have, what's the point of being attached to them? Death is enemy to, uh, this enemy of ours will certainly arrive, but when it will arrive is uncertain. Since we could die even today, we should make preparations. To make preparation means to practice the pure Dharma right now without being attached to the desirable things of this life. So this is the conclusion that we reach. I will certainly die. I could even die today. And in order to go through this process in a meaningful way, I must be prepared. I can only be prepared through the practice of Dharma. Therefore, I must practice, I must practice pure Dharma, and I must practice it right now. So here it is, the request. Therefore, I beseech you, Supreme Guru Yidam, bless us so that we can practice in this way. Due to this fervent request from the body of the Guru Yidam, at the crown of your head descends nectar together with five colors light, which enter in you as well as in all mother sentient beings' bodies and minds. It purifies what hinders this realization. In particular, imagine that the special realization of this topic is generated in our minds. Okay, so as you can see today, we cover the subject of death and impermanence. We meditate on it by looking at the three roots and giving three reasons to each one of those roots. So we have a total of nine reasoning. At the end, we end up with three conclusions. So the three roots are that death is certain. The second one is that the actual time of death is uncertain. And the third one is that at the time of death, only Dharma can be of benefit. As we say, for each one of them, we give three reasons. So we have a total of nine reasons. Having contemplated those nine reasons, we reach uh, three conclusions. When we understand that death is certain, the conclusion that we reach is that I must practice Dharma. When we understand that the actual time of death is uncertain, the conclusion that we reach is that I must practice Dharma now, immediately, right now. And when we understand that at the time of death, only Dharma can be of benefit, the third conclusion that we reach is that I should only practice Dharma. It doesn't make any sense to try to do other things, only Dharma. So we contemplate on the three roots by uh, relying on the nine reasons and we reach these three important conclusions. I will practice Dharma, I will practice it right now, and I will only practice Dharma. That's the only thing that is of benefit. So in this way, we have covered the first of the four major topics that come under the actual uh, training when you are training in the past that are common with the individual of the small scope. We will continue with our next lesson with the other three major outlines in this section. So now we have a little bit of time for questions and answers. So please, if you have any questions, uh, ask them. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Kishila. Um, so, Vola, can we um, invite you to translate one question over here? So, thank you, Jopan Ling, for hosting the teachings and special thanks to Kishila for the clear teachings. I feel very lucky to be able to receive your teachings and I revise your teachings as much as I can. Your teachings have been very inspiring. Thank you so much, Gisela. Here, can I ask Gisela for your advice to help someone who does not have extensive Dharma experience and she is dying soon? For, um, she is a patient who has six months to live. 
Her mind is full of grief and hopelessness because she does not have deep Dharma understanding. What would Gishila recommend that I could help or is there any specific practice um, that she can do to help her remaining life? Thank mm -hmm. you. All right, so Gesha is saying here, we're dealing with a person that, as you say, uh, does not uh, really engage the Dharma, doesn't have Dharma inclination. And also if she's towards the end of her life, she doesn't have that much time to practice or to take on the practice. So it would be very difficult if you were to give her some advice for Dharma practice, it would be very difficult to benefit because I don't think that she would take it on. If you think that she would have some faith in some mantra, then perhaps she could recite the mantra of our teacher, Buddha Shakyamuni. But it is quite possible that actually she doesn't have much faith in Buddha Shakyamuni and she will find it pointless to recite the mantra. If that is the case, you can do this practice on her behalf. So you can recite the mantra of Buddha Shakyamuni for her, on her behalf for her benefit. Or you can go for refuge. Um, for her benefit or any practice that you do. So you mentioned here that you study the Lamrim and you know, studying the Lamrim, you created a lot of root of virtue. So from the beginning, when you engage in any of your Dharma activities, you do it with the motivation that says, I will do it to benefit my friend. And at the end, you dedicate your root of virtue for her, her well being. Thank you, Bola and Yinda. Now, Tass. So, Gishla, dedication. We will keep one more question for next week. Um, yeah, on Saturday, sorry.